Okay, for the next installment, we have Anna Dobson, our HR specialist. I met Anna. I had the privilege of meeting Anna through Ed at her Mastermind event, which, by the way, was amazing. It was great food, great company there. Great weather. And I'm so happy to have you on the on the podcast to learn a little bit more. Uh, what's going on, Anna? Thank you. Thank you, Nima, for having me. And Ed, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Been looking forward to this since I got invited to it, so I'm I'm ready. Yeah, so Ed, how do you and Anna know each other, by the way? You know, we've known each other for a long time, actually, before she had her agency. And it's just, you know, the power of networking, right? Great people introduce other great people. So here we are, speaking of greatness, I mean, you're going to see very quickly. I mean, look, we all have expertise in our subject matters. But as you know, not all people are created equal. So, for example, realtors, not all of them are the same. Mortgage people, not all the same. Mm -hmm. And in this case, when it comes to benefits, you know, definitely not the same. You know, she has a heart for business owners. She has a heart for employees. She knows the sacrifice. She knows how hard people work on both sides, both being, though, you know, so being a business owner, right? She's done both, like, like all of us have. And so she's the perfect marriage of benefits and also HR, right? So she helps both, even though she specializes more on the, the benefits. So that's how I know her. That's how we're here. Nice, man. Hey, Ed, um, is your microphone a little further from your, from where it normally is? Because the, the quality is usually like on point. Now it just seems a little faded. It, it might be my pizza people trying to sabotage. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I see. I Did see. I just give away my location? <laughs> you did yeah, brought and you gave on, pizza on plug I like that okay so uh, Anna how long have you been working in the HR space so funny I've been in the employee benefit space for 16 years and in the HR space about six. Oh, nice okay and um was there, was this like a natural progression of something that you wanted to get into like you're like you know what I, I like vibing with people at work and, you know, in that type of space, like what brought you into that? So it's really funny. Cause like Ed said, I have this just love for business owners and businesses themselves and helping people in general. But when I started out in the insurance industry, it wasn't like my dream job. I wasn't, this is not, I kind of fell into it. And if you talk to most benefits people, they'll say the same thing. Like they didn't mm -hmm. intend to, my husband was going to be a firefighter. And his dad had an agency and he just never went back to firefighting. Like everyone has a similar story. I was looking for an executive assistant job and they were like, hmm, you'd be really good at client service. Have you considered being an account manager for this insurance agency? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds bomb. Let's do it. So mm -hmm. they threw a book of business at me and I was responsible for making sure that these clients were taken care of. And the major majority of the business were small startup tech companies in Silicon Valley. And I was just responsible for making sure that their employees got set up with benefits, that we were finding the best possible plans for the right cost along their budget and that it could grow with the organization. And I just fell in love with helping these businesses, not just in the insurance space. I actually found that the insurance is just a means to an end for me. It's a product. Mm -hmm. But really what the value that I bring is that actual caring for the business and seeing it thrive and helping them come up with creative ways to afford healthcare because it's the second to third largest expense for any business. It's not peanuts, um, you know, but it's really, really important. And so I just fell in love with that process. And then I've worked with companies as large as 1,500 employees down to two employees but I just love helping the small businesses because they really value what I can bring to the table. They actually are, you know, value the resources that we can bring versus the large guys. They have benefit specialists and there's all these layers and levels of people that you got to get through. And, and for them, it's kind of like, what have you done for me lately versus right. the small businesses are like, thank you for helping us navigate this crazy insurance world. Yeah. Oh, what a cute looking dog, by the way, in the background. Oh, yeah, he's annoying. <laughs> he's cute, but he's a pain. Get that, that haircut or he or she. Wow, interesting. Okay. Yeah, we had to do that. 
not okay. by choice. Okay. So from two to like 1500. Wow. So I'm sure when people start expanding their businesses and all of a sudden, you know, they got some sales folks, they got some marketing, now they're hiring people for, you know, different roles. They need something like an HR generalist or something just to make sure, right, for like the, like you said, to, to make sure for like health insurance, maybe 401ks, things like that as well. Absolutely. So what happened was I really got into the small businesses and that was my niche market. And I was a VP for an organization, a small boutique firm in San Jose. And employers kept coming to me for their HR because small businesses don't have consultants on retainer. They don't have in-house HR support. We were offering like a free 1-800 number where they can call for all their HR support. Mm -hmm. But let's face it, those are not customized to the organization. They're literally just, here's a template, figure it out. And they would still come to me because I knew their organization. So they wanted to know, how does this apply to me? And so I just saw this need for HR for small to mid-sized businesses. And that's when I started Level Up Pros. It was that employee benefits that I've always done in my career, but then now marrying that with HR because they go together anyway. Um, and brokers don't want to touch the HR piece and HR people don't want to touch the benefits piece. And I'm like, I'll do it. So that's how we got to where we are. And now we support small to mid-sized businesses. Yes. As they grow, as their needs change. And I find that today in age, there's a lot more value being seen in outside consultants instead of having in-house HR. Oh, okay. I see. And for them, what are some of those benefits? Like you had mentioned how you essentially do yeah. A to Z now, right? Where certain people are just, this is my niche, this is my niche, but you can you can do everything from A to Z to get them started, which is awesome. Um, now, you being able to like have that type of experience and go into business for yourself, like all three of us on the call have, that's a, a very liberating, yet scary <laughs> I uh, think to go through, right? Like, because all of a sudden it's like, you're, you're leaving everything. I mean, the sky's the limit as they say, but you're like, wow, this just got real. I'm in for business for myself. And you, you know, you have to ensure that, that you can, you know, get the word out and, and get on as many clients as you can. So do you generally operate from like word of mouth? Yeah. So far we've been fortunate. We started the business in July of 2021. So still COVID, um, but I didn't let that scare me. It was just one of those things where I didn't actually see myself starting a business for at least another year. Mm -hmm. But things just happened where I was and the opportunity was just like right in front of me and I had to take it. It was just like, it was the timing, honestly. And so um, it was just one of those things that just worked out for me. And so, and I lost track of your question because this talk is <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was like so trying to focus on you, but the dog totally distracted me. That, that little lion's tail, man, it looks really interesting. <laughs> oh, goodness. So you asked me what starting a business, sorry. No problem. What? Yeah, I mean, just being able to go with all the experience that you have, taking all that experience under your belt and going to business for yourself, like all three of us here have done that, right? And it's like, there's pros and cons, as they say, right? There's a lot of upside, but you get a little worried, right? Depending on how long you've been in the business for. So I was just curious to see how you're attaining, you know, a gaining business, how it differs from Ed in my my way. Thank you. That was it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I started during COVID. I've been fortunate enough to be able to nurture these relationships over long periods of time. So some of my relationships with, HR consultants that were referring business to me on the benefit side, I've known for 17 years so since I started in the industry. And I've just nurtured those relationships wherever I was. And sure enough, when I started Level Up Pros, it was just like, yeah, we're going to follow you wherever you are. So now it's your own company. And I was just very fortunate with those relationships that they did follow me and they moved their business over to Level Up. So from day one, we had business, especially on the benefit side. The HR was a new product, so that was scary. 
but there was a need that I had seen and I knew that it was going to be really popular and effective. And sure enough, like as soon as we started offering like the subscription service that we offer, that's what we started. That was our first HR product is like, Mm -hmm. Hey, for 300 bucks a month where we are your HR consultant, you can email us, call us anytime. We'll help you with any HR issues. And that just started selling like hotcakes. So now it's like, we either get in through the HR piece and then take over the benefits eventually or enter through the benefits. And then we find that there's an HR need. And that's just how it's been evolving over the last two years and referrals through those same clients. Oh, okay. I see. Nice. So then you, they're happy with you. Yeah. They tell their friend that's also starting up a, a company. And I mean, look at you're in the middle of Silicon Valley where you're based. So you get Right, you got all the way up to down in San in, in Santa Clara County, right where Silicon Valley is, and up in the city. There's so many businesses that are being started all the time. You know, since we live in the cradle of innovation here, and I'm sure there's definitely a need for those types of things. When you're talking about the like the step to step stuff that you provide, it makes me think about situations that I've seen on TV, like or or even in the news, like with um, subordinates, right, with like where a manager's dating somebody. And how that's disclosed or sometimes lack thereof, and they end up getting terminated. I saw recently in a few media companies, for example, where they had a relationship. And I think on ABC, if I'm not mistaken, I think two anchors were were hooking up or something like that. And oh they were oh, let yeah, go, yeah. right? I mean, oh, how, you. how do you, somebody like you, like, so do they, do they initially come to you and disclose these things? How does that work? So it's really interesting. So in the beginning, you know, our contracts were di- written differently and our relationships were written differently. We very quickly learned that one of the first things in starting a relationship with a client is like full transparency. There has mm-hmm. to be trust and there has to be transparency because if we're not made aware of something, then we can't help you. Right. And it, it happened. Like one client was like, Hey, I want to terminate this employee because we can't afford his H-1B renewal for his visa. And I was like, that's fine. I mean, you can do that as a business if it's going to cause a financial strain or hardship to the business. There's no problem with that. As long as you're not discriminating, you're not doing Well, lo and behold, we're giving them this advice, not knowing that the employee had actually filed a sexual harassment claim. And so they were about to get sued. And we're like, if you would have told us this, we would not have advised you that way. And so obviously not our fault, but it did get into a legal situation. And we're just like, that's it going forward. If you don't tell us anything, if you don't tell us something, we don't know what we don't know. We can't advise you properly. So now it's in our service agreement when we kick off a relationship, like, Hey, you got to tell us everything that's going on currently, things that have happened in the past, what's your culture like, yeah. You know, where are you seeing these issues? Where do you see potential issues? We can't have that because we're really trying to help you and we can't help you if we don't know things that you're not telling sure. us. Yeah, a small little little detail to leave out there, right? Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, by I, the I, way. <laughs> oh, that's right. Did I forget to tell you that? It must have slipped my mind. And I think it's, it speaks to the necessity of having to outsource these kind of things as a small business because think about it. I mean, when you're wearing so many hats, and, and, and look, let's let's be totally transparent here. Most people start businesses, particularly, I would say, more visionaries, more salesy side as opposed to unless obviously we're talking about somebody who's an engineer who starts something in the specific um, engineering type of group. But if they're starting a typical business, your business owner is more of the visionary and is more of the PR and the face of things. And so when they're juggling all these things, it makes it very inefficient unless it hurts revenues because they're not out there. So when you outsource these things, then you can focus more on the things that are important to bring in revenue, growing the business, when you growing the product, when you the service line. In her case, you know, she was able to create a subscription at 300 bucks. That's what I think they said. If you're overwhelmed, you don't have that kind of land. So I think that this service really plays a drill being able to yeah and um 
So you're, you, you, with your clients, Anna, uh, are they predominantly based local or do you operate nationwide? We have some technical difficulties going on. I know. I'm sorry. I lost you for a minute. No problem. No problem. I'm going to, I'm going to repeat that. Um, you know, with your, with respect to your clientele, um, are they generally local or do you operate nationwide? That's a great question. Um, mostly local. So we have clients in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Washington state. Um, and then we've had clients in New York, so we can, I am the, in the HR space, because California is probably the hardest state to do HR in, mm -hmm. we can pretty much function in any other state. Um, and we have a lot of experience in various different states. So, and a lot of it, you know, with COVID and everything, people moving outside of California, a lot of companies, whether they're based in California or have been based in California, now have employees all over. And that doesn't, and you being based in California and your employees leaving voluntarily does not excuse you from following those California state laws and also local laws. And especially with like wage and hours and workman's comp and parental leave and all those things. So we have to know all of those things. So while the majority of our clients are in California, we can function pretty much nationwide. That's fantastic. Why? Well, and you bring up something really interesting because we've all heard about people doing remote work, right? And they thought they they outsmarted the system. Let's just say when <laughs> folks didn't have to come to the office, right? And I knew some folks that, you know, for example, the guy that bought a a, pro, um, a home outside of Sacramento in Granite Bay. And then, you know, I guess he wasn't thinking that he'd ever have to drive back to Apple for whatever reason. And now he has to drive back three days a week. Oy. Dude, that, that was, that's on you, man. I, I saw that. Right. I'm surprised you didn't. But, you know, I digress. Um, or let's just say out of state, you know, there was some, people i've read i've read a few articles but folks have like relocated to phoenix uh, pure illinois and like other places Bo boise idaho right like those zoom towns as they call them and how do you if the company is based in california and let's just say they're working out of idaho uh how do you navigate that so it's been really eye-opening because you're absolutely right nima people didn't they way underestimated the consequences of employees leaving california so they thought like cool i'll pay less taxes i'll pay less wages yeah they forgot to set up their payroll taxes in that particular state you still have to pay payroll taxes in that state even if you have one employee working there you also have to set up workman's comp there you also have to be aware of the leave policies there because they vary from state to state and you have to follow the state and even local you know if it's a county or something that's a little bit different you have to abide by those so people way underestimated so even in our first two years we've been doing a lot of sub administrative stuff like helping employers set up payroll taxes in other state or payroll um, identification numbers to be able to pay taxes in that state just all these things that were unforeseen mm -hmm. are really coming to light. So it's an education for everybody and a real, real opportunity for us. And is that the case also internationally when you have a client that just decides to go to another country? Absolutely. So Canada is one that, you know, uh, is very common. A lot of companies in California outsource to Canada. There's a big tech boom happening in that area. And so they're hiring a lot of people there. And yeah, you got to abide by Canadian law. Um, they have different health care laws, different leave laws. So, yeah, I mean, global HR is even becoming a bigger need now, too. Wow, that's really interesting. And why is California the hardest state to do HR in? Oh, man, because we have so many laws and it's yeah. so litigious. Um, and it, it really is an employee centric, not employer centric state. So it's always, so here the burden of truth is always on the employer. So if I'm an employee and I make a complaint, the burden is on the employer to prove that that didn't happen or that it did happen or whatever the case is. But it, the burden of proof is on the employer. It's super litigious and employees are extremely protected in this state. Oh man. So Which is why our taxes are so high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. No wonder. So lawyers probably love to do business in California, huh? It's love it. I mean, yeah, here you can charge seven fifty an hour. And I mean, we've been part of a few lawsuits. Again, those things where some 
Ed mentioned it earlier, we would rather come in on a proactive basis. So like avoiding these things from happening in the first place. And that's where we struggle really communicating to employers. Like you think you don't need HR, but then something blows up and then you realize that you did need it and you would have saved yourself hundreds of thousands of dollars if you would have had HR because this all would have been avoided with a simple policy, right? Or a procedure right. that you didn't have in place. But oftentimes people do wait, especially the small businesses, because they don't want to put out the money. And that's why we make it affordable too. Um, but then we get caught in a situation where the house is on fire and now we're being asked to put it out. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, we'd rather not do that, but it's still very common. So what I really want to get out to people is like, just like everything else, it's better to be proactive and less costly to do things right from the beginning, especially startup businesses. When I started this company, one of my biggest things was like, I want to be right with the IRS from day one. I don't want any issues with the IRS. So I'm going to find a pro to keep our books because I am not that person. I never want to get in trouble with the IRS. And if I let this go, the bigger issues come up later. And that's just costly and time consuming and all the other things. Same thing with HR. Uh, okay, interesting. It's insurance. It's insurance. Decision making insurance. Yes. Don't buy insurance. That's what ends up happening. You have to be very reactive. It's going to be way more costly. Way more. You just would have just done it. And um, do short term sacrifice for long term gain. But people don't do that. They do the opposite. Like people who are underinsured with their cars, they get into a crash, and now they're going to realize there's a gap that they have to fill in. Now they're in trouble and they go back. Exactly. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. Ed, and I'm in the insurance space and I didn't even think about it that way. But yeah, it's insuring your, your business. I mean, well, having I a simple question. handbook. Yeah, even a handbook. Exactly. How many small businesses don't even have a handbook? They don't have a handbook. It's huge, right? So I got a question for you. Especially in our area and you know, it's all these techniques have an insane type of of benefits, particularly EAPs, you know, it's just for, you know, bring your dog and we'll, we'll get your dog massages and dental care. How do you tell know, these small to medium sized business owners and benefits stay competitive? I love this question because in the small business, so in California, small business market is any employer who has 100 or less employees. If you have 101 or more, you fall into the large group market where you have negotiating power with the carriers and you have more options as to how the plans are designed. In the small group, they're filed with the state of California on a quarterly basis and they have zero negotiating power. So if you're a business in, in San Francisco and the business next door to you has 25 employees and you have 55 employees, you're going to get the same plans. You're going to get the same options as far as benefits go. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to be competitive and creative in this space. But I have found ways. I'll give you just a quick example. By buying a very high deductible health plan um, and then having the employer then fund a portion of that deductible so the employee doesn't feel like they have that huge deductible We've been able to save companies hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and it's just a very great way to give small employers control back because at the end of the day, while I get paid with by the insurance carriers, I'm an advocate and I'm working for my clients. I am not working for Kaiser or Anthem Blue Cross or Blue Shield or Aetna. I am working for my clients. So I'm going to do what is best for them and it's what, and what's going to be a long-term solution. So that's like one of the ways that we've been able to be really competitive because we work a lot with high tech companies and CEOs that came from like Microsoft or Apple and they're used to Cadillac level benefits. And we're like, yeah, but now you have an eight employee company like that's not we're talking apples and oranges here. How do we bridge that gap? Well, we did it with a company here in Los Altos where we said, hey, take a high deductible health plan, fund as much of the deductible as you want. Because statistically, we know that only 1% of your population is going to hit that deductible or out-of-pocket maximum. So your liability is small 
because you're banking on the bigger pool of people that are actually not going to get surgeries, don't have a lot of health care expense. Um, so even if you have one that maxes out, the rest of them make up for that and you're able to control your costs better. So that's something that we've been really successful in using for our company. I love that. That's super creative. I love that. Yeah. And, and a lot of bookers said. don't like it. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. I'll do it all day long. <laughs> but I love how you said that. Even though you may have a lot of carriers that you don't, for the, you don't work for the carriers you work for, the client. I can relate because I have a lot of lenders, but at the end of the day, my client is my borrower. That's it. That's who I work exactly. for. I pick out the best loan program and the best lender that can close quicker and get us there efficiently for the benefit of my client. Right. It's one of the hundred percent the same thing. And brokers don't like this program because their commissions get cut, right? If mm -hmm. I sell you a platinum plan, if I'm making five percent commission, because that's what we make in the small group is five percent. If I'm selling you a platinum plan that has like zero percent deductible, the premiums are super high, I make five percent on that, that's a big chunk of money. If I drop you to a bronze plan, I'm cutting my commissions by 30%. It's a lot and it's a little bit more administratively burdensome, but I don't look at it that way because I just feel like, you know, if I earn the trust of my clients and then the word gets out, right, that I'm doing this in a creative way and I'm saving companies hundreds of thousands of dollars, well, then that feeds itself like that. I'll just get the, the business that way. Like I'd rather do what's right for the You're business looking at the bigger picture and than focus right. on the commissions. Yeah. It's always the best way to do business. Uh, it's amazing how many people are out there that all they care about is making money right now. They don't see the big picture. They're not in the long game. And so they cut exactly. corners like this. And then guess what? Their referral business goes completely for foot because they missed the referral for the whole purpose. Of yeah. Why we're here to be humble servants. Exactly. I'd rather make small commissions over 10 years than big commissions for two years. Like it just, doesn't make sense. I'd rather have that long-term relationship. I don't remember who said this, but there's a saying out there that says, I'd rather get I'd rather get a hundred percent of a little bit than or I'd rather get one percent of a little bit than get a hundred percent of nothing. Right. <laughs> yeah. There you it's go. It's the same premise. And those relationships feed on each other. And it's just this it's and I find a lot more satisfaction as a professional to be able to help my clients and then be with me long term. Then I get to know them long term. I get to grow with them. We get to evolve things together. Then you become that trusted advisor, not a vendor. Hmm. So what does the PHR acronym stand for? Professional Human Resources. Why did I not? <laughs> you know, my, my business coach, she always tells me, Nemo, you need more of this. He always says GTS, like Google that shit. He's like Nemo, GTS, and I'm like, you know, I can, but but maybe I can just ask Anna. Like there might be a story behind it, and I'm like, nope. I I totally just, psh. yeah. It's yeah. hilarious because um, it's a really hard test. I never want to take it again. It's one of those things. I'm sure Ed, you have licenses that are like this too. I mean, the insurance license is hard too. You never want to take that test again. It was um, when I decided that I was going to be in HR, I was like, okay, what's going to make me instantly credible? Okay, well, the PHR, you have to have two to five years experience in HR, and you have to go to all these courses. It's about six months, and you have to take a really hard test at the end. Um, and I was like, done, I'm doing it. So got my certification oh. July of 21. Um and I got to keep up those credits because I never want to take that darn test again. <laughs> yeah, nice. Did you have to do that? Was that in state or online? How did you take that exam? I uh, no, I did it in person. Uh huh. I did the courses online um, through HRCI, which is very well renowned and known for their HR certification. It's very credible. And then I went in person to a state facility to take the exam. And when I came out. It's like, oh man, I know I didn't pass. Oh man. And then she's like, You passed. And I was like, Are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? To it's that point, Anna, congratulations on rule number two. I mean, these designations really matter. 
And for those of you who are business owners who are even thinking about hiring or outsourcing, I mean, this is one of the things you want to use for your vetting. Who has that designation? I didn't know that existed. You know, so I learned something new today, and it makes all the difference because the more certifications and the more that profession invest in themselves and in their business, the more they're going to be committed to you. And I think that's exactly. a huge difference. It shows that you care, that you care about the industry and the clients and you care about knowing and having the knowledge base to be able to be the most valuable person to your client. 100%. And plus, it also shows that you made the transition from career to a calling. That now you consider this a calling, not just a career. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so funny because I work with a lot of HR professionals my entire benefits career. I've had a lot of HR friends just naturally. So it just seemed to like kind of just fit. It just kind of all came together just as it was supposed to. Nice. That's inspiring for me because as Ed knows, I'm working on some credentials for the commercial real estate space because, you know, I got about a decade of experience in, on the residential side and I've been looking to get more into the commercial side as well and not leave, you know, with clients reaching out to me for, hey, I need help with, I'm looking to lease a, a, a salon, you know, I'm looking to leave, um, open up a martial arts academy and then not being able to help. I'm like, man, I, I got to change this experience for my friends or even my past clients. And um, there's like this high level certification for commercial real estate. And it's exactly what how you're describing it. You know, I've started taking these online courses and I got to fly to Seattle for the exam. I think they got like a fall and like a spring wow. exam time frame. Yeah, I probably will make the fall this time because, you know, we all still work full time and we have families to take care of. Right. So it's kind of that has to be it's like it's super important, but it has to be the lowest priority, really, you know, because there's like yeah. a lot more important things. So, yeah. So that's inspirational to me because like as Ed had mentioned too, making it from a, a career to a calling and like you said, I want to be able to be taken seriously once I get into the commercial space because it's a lot more competitive. There's some, uh, you know, the way they describe commercial agents as being a little more rougher and stuff like that. And I want to be able to just go in there and not being some guy who just, you know, goes and grabs their coffee just to get a little tidbit of information, but walk yeah. in there and immediately get that type of respect, you know, and that's why I'm I'm going towards the Anna Dobson route in my own career. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. That's amazing. It's not easy. Because like you said, we yeah. have so many other priorities. And I think that was not the learning experience, what you learn about yourself too, especially right we've all been out of college for a long time. Yeah. We're not used to studying and being in a class for that long and paying attention like that and taking yeah. a test. What is that like? Um, but showing myself that commitment was really rewarding. I think it proved a lot to myself. It was rewarding for myself. It was just like, wow, I made this commitment. I saw it through. I accomplished it. It wasn't easy. And here's my big reward. Absolutely. And from the beginning, it's just like that that level up, right? That resume builder that you can throw on there. And it, like you said, immediately shows your experience. And you're just kind of like, right? It takes you to the top of that Absolutely. list. I love hearing that. Absolutely. It helps. It'll never no. not help. Right. True. True. You might weigh it, right? Like, ha, ha, I wonder how, what was the ROI with all this work, right? And finances and time put into it. But sometimes you can't really tell that immediately, right? It takes time to build up. Mm -hmm. But it will always be to your benefit. Even if it's just, you know, even if you decided to change careers later, at least for yourself, it's always going to show, it's always going to be rewarding one way or another. Truth. Yeah, that's very true. Now, how has the industry, the HR industry, how has it changed over the past decade from, let's say, 2013 to now? I feel so fortunate again, and I just feel like it was that calling. Like, I came into this space at the right time because I feel like in, like, I was in benefits back in 2008. And the first people to be let go were HR professionals from all these tech companies and startups and stuff, mm -hmm. right? And so it shows you how much value they had placed on these people. Like, we don't need HR. We're going to get rid of them. We're going to keep right. all the engineers and everybody else, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's changing. I think that people are really starting to see the value in HR, especially with COVID. That really accelerated everything um, because people were like scrambling to figure out, you know, COVID protocols and what do I do in this situation? What do I do when this person calls in sick? And how do I ask for this? And all these things. And people were left scrambling. Um, and so I think that that really accelerated the HR profession with more value, seen as more valuable to an organization than just some kind of admin. I think it was very administrative even 10 years ago. Now we're seen as people that can come to the C-suite, to the table and actually make an impact on the business. Because the other thing is, my husband and I talk about this all the time, HR people were seen as like, you're not making us money, you're helping us spend money so right. they're not seen as valuable, but one of my biggest goals with starting Level Up Pros was that we were seen as strategists. So if you look at my logo, it says benefits consultants and HR strategists. We are not administrative people. We're not consultants. We want to strategize with the CEO, the CFO to really get the business to the next level. We're not here just to push paper. Okay. And from going back to you serving from two person company to 1500 do you have like a niche that maybe would like something that you're predominantly more um how can i put this um like you just have a lot more experience with 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 that size for example like i'm thinking the way i do it. what's that ed like a specialty like a specialty yeah i mean i yeah. think about like okay in my market where i work right now the, my bread and butter is probably around that $1.3 million single family home range, right? I don't really work well that much in luxury. Now, I've sold a $3 million, $4 million house before. I would love to sell another one, but I don't really get that many calls from that from that type. You know, it's it's my, my bread and butter is that mid-market type of tier. So I'm just curious if you're in your profession, you have something similar to, to employee size. Absolutely. In the benefit space, it's kind of different. So for benefits, I would say that 25 to 150 mm-hmm. is kind of our niche, employees wise, employee size, because that's what we do in benefits. Um, on the HR side, it's funny because I we've worked for 1500 employee companies, but usually companies at that size have in-house HR. So they either need you for very specific projects or for a very short period of time. And we're looking for long-term relationships. And so I think that, again, I think in that 25 to 100 space um, and companies that are growing that need that support and are not ready because the rule of thumb is that you need one HR HR person for every hundred employees, right? Oh, and most okay. companies don't want to spend that money, even if they get to a hundred. So the best way to bridge that gap is to hire outside consulting. And so I think that can get you a very long way. And maybe you don't need to hire HR till you get 200 in house. So I think that that hundred up to a hundred space is really a, a good place for us and to be able to build that long-term relationship. Cause we just, we didn't renew a, an account recently. They were 500 employees because they had a whole HR team in house. And so by the time we got them all trained up, they didn't need us anymore. And so, and understandably, I mean, that that's great, right? We did our job um, maybe too well. Um, but <laughs> I want to be in it for the long term and help these small businesses grow. So I yeah. like the the smaller the smaller growing businesses. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. And with the HR stuff, did you do any um, any recruiting or anything like that? We've done a lot of recruiting. We've done recruiting for tech companies. We've done recruiting yeah. for in-home care um, because we've had a lot of those clients. So oftentimes we get brought in as HR. And, you know, there's a lot of recruiters out there. Like, you yeah, probably all get bombarded with recruiting emails all the time. Like, hey, we'll recruit for you. What differentiates us is number one, we usually come in as your HR generalist or your HR specialist or your HR business partner. So we get to know your culture and your organization. So now we know what you need and what you're looking for, but also we don't charge that ridiculous 25%. If we hire 25% of salary is what's typical in the recruiting market. Um, 
of salary, first year salary. We don't charge that because again, we're going for the long-term relationship. So if we're, we're already your HR people, then you're going to get us to be able to recruit for you for a lot lesser amount and also bring more value because we know your organization and your culture at that point. So yeah, lots of recruiting. We'll do it as a one-off too, but we it kind of just organically bundle happens. it. Yeah. Is that how mm -hmm. you are there any verticals that you like more than others? You know, like are there law firms versus medical tech companies versus small medical private groups? We love professional services. So we love the engineering. We have marketing businesses, um, CPAs, that kind of thing. But we've done in-home care, which actually has its own challenges and needs a lot of help. <laughs> in-home care is not an easy industry. Mm -hmm. You know, you have people that are making low wages, their hours are super variable, they usually don't get benefits, there's a lot of like, you know, injuries and complaints and all kinds of things that you have to deal with, which makes it really fun and interesting and really gives us like a full breadth of things. I think the professional services, you know, you're a little bit more mellow, there aren't so many issues, you're more helping on the strategic things, like how do we get this business to the next level properly? What happens when we reach 50 employees? What laws do we have to follow? That kind of thing. Whereas in-home care tends to be more reactive, um, more like, ah, oh, the house is on fire again because this person injured themselves or is going on leave and we don't have a replacement kind of deal. So while we don't have like a particular niche, those are like the most common that we work with. Good questions. Well, and I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. It was really interesting to learn more about your space. I I don't know too many people that I can ask these types of questions to, to learn more about HR. And I love it. you immediately had me with the, uh, the hi, hello dot me <laughs> <laughs> when we met. And I I'm like, it. damn, okay, I see you. Again, going back to how amazing it is to have great masterminds. Thank you, Mr. Edgar Diaz, for I know, Ed. This wouldn't be possible that. without you. Yeah. Always, you know, it's all about creating community, right? I mean, this is how we all help other people. One plus one equals four. It's called synergy. We're doing it right now as we speak. Yeah. It's fantastic. And Nima, anytime you have HR questions, please reach out. I'll be your resource. Definitely. I mean, sometimes, you know, we help people like both Ed and I when hey, I'm starting a company, you know, and we we got a decent amount of seed funding. I don't know how much that can go for their housing needs, but right. People, these are questions to, to, to be asking like, oh, tell me more about your company. And you learn a little bit and they don't have an HR person there. Like I, I know a gal now. Now I do, because before I didn't. I've known people that have worked oh. at like HR slash recruiting for some of the tech companies like Apple sure. and VMware, for example, over the years. Now they're more like acquaintances. Um, but, you know, having somebody who has their own business like you and can go to a literally like a one person shop, like what I have, two people technically to, you know, over a thousand. It's I think it's it's very valuable to know somebody like that, both to, for referral purposes, but also to ask them questions once they they, you know, come across something like that, especially we all reside in the most litigious state in the nation. You know, I'm learning that today. A hundred percent. And hey, right back at you guys. Like anytime I see an opportunity. And in fact, my husband and I are trying to buy a home soon. So I already know who what two guys I'm gonna be working with. So it's gonna be great. We are, and we are again, at your service seven energy. days a week. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Yeah, my pleasure, much. Anna. Thank you so much. And Hey, if, if people want to connect with you, what's the what's the best way? Uh, email or my phone, but my email address is Anna, A-N-N-A, at levelup-pros.com. Anna at levelup-pros.com. Got it. Okay. Well, we appreciate you getting on here, Ed. I appreciate you making it happen at the un undisclosed Pete's Coffee, <laughs> somewhere, my assumption, in the Marina District of San Francisco, but shh, we won't. Absolutely not. Oh, yeah, there you go. Let's keep it. He's all over the place. Yeah. Never know where I'm going to be. Exactly. It's where's Ed. I'm like Santa Claus, man. I, I got my sleigh parked outside. <laughs> <laughs> I love it.
Thank you both so much. I, we lost you, Nima. I can't hear uh, you. Somehow we lost your your uh, your audio. Your audio. It seems like uh, maybe maybe we have some spies trying to find out where you're at. Yeah, we still can't hear you, unfortunately. So I will say goodbye to both of you then. I will bid you adieu. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Anna. Ima, thank you, always, Ed. Thank you for facilitating. Have a great day, guys. Love it. Take, Take care. care.